Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Data Collection as Environmental Enrichment, Automated Behavioral Measurement in Voluntary Home Cage Operant Tasks, and presented by Jamie Alloy Dallaire, postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Comparative Medicine at Stanford University. I am Alexis Corrales of Labyrinths, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labyrinths. Labyrinths is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your question into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the accreditation button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please joining me and welcome Jamie Alloy Dallaire. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Alexis. And hi to everyone uh, watching this presentation. My presentation is about collecting experimental data from research animals directly in their home cages by using automated versions of operative tests that they get to engage with on a voluntary basis. I'm going to focus on why and how we should integrate these types of tests into biomedical research especially, and particularly in mice because of how widely used this species is. So here's a quick outline of how this presentation will unfold. I'm going to start off by telling you why I think you should care, which is that animal models in biomedical research currently aren't really producing results that carry over into human patients as readily as we'd like them to. And I'm hoping to convince you that part of the solution to make these results more applicable to humans is to treat research animals more like we treat human patients. And among other things, that means making their well-being a top priority. And I hope to show you that in general, this is beneficial not just for the animals, but for the quality of the science itself. I'll then go into detail on the role and the potential benefits of one very specific aspect of treating animals like humans, which is collecting data from them voluntarily in their home cages, instead of forcing them to participate in standard hand-run tests that they might find aversive in various ways. So here's, here's the big problem that we're trying to deal with. Out of all the experimental drugs that are tested in human clinical trials, only 11% of them succeed in making it to market. One reason for 89% of them failing is that sometimes there's unexpected side effects, but most of the time it's because they just don't work. And that's pretty mind blowing because all of these drugs were first tested in animals and they worked. That's why they ended up being tested in humans. And the, the ethical consequences of this are pretty horrifying because it means that too many animals are being used in experiments that usually induce some sort of suffering. And then there's not enough benefit coming back in the form of effective treatments being developed for human patients who are also, of course, suffering. So what, what's going on? Why don't these treatments work in the, in the humans if they worked in the animals? I think a big part of that reason is that Preclinical research on animals is often done very differently from clinical research on human patients. This includes how the experiments are analyzed and designed, and it includes how the human and animal patients are treated throughout the course of the experiment, and how the outcomes of the experiment are measured. To put it more bluntly, I think it's often the case that the human and the animal researchers are using different goalposts, or different ways of determining whether a drug works or not. And so it's then not surprising that they sometimes get different answers. And these are issues that we explored in a review paper that we published last year in the journal Lab Animal. And of course, we're not the only ones. There are many, many, many other authors who've discussed these issues along with some potential solutions. And I'm just showing you a very small selection of these papers here. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on the issue of trying to treat animals humanely in the same way that we treat, treat human patients. And I'll focus on how this can affect the quality of the science. So let's start with a few examples. Here's some data from an experiment on self-administration of analgesic drugs, or painkillers, in mice. Female mice were uh, subjected to an experimental surgery, and then they were allowed to self-medicate to relieve their own pain. 
They had two bottles in their home cage, one of them containing water and the other one containing ibuprofen. And ibuprofen intake, ibuprofen intake increased over the two weeks following surgery in the operated mice, which is exactly what you'd expect if they're in pain and if the ibuprofen is relieving that pain effectively. But here's the crucial twist. The mice were housed in one of four different conditions. They were either housed in groups of three or by themselves. And they were either housed in barren cages that contained only wood chip bedding on the bottom of the cage, or they were housed in environmentally enriched cages that also contained material to build a nest and some wooden chewing sticks. And it turned out that the mice consumed less of the analgesic if they were housed in groups and if they were housed in enriched cages. So what this shows is that the social and physical environment of these mice affected how severe their pain was and how much pain relief they felt that they needed. I'll show you another example to show that this isn't just something that's going on in their heads. Here's an example where the housing environment actually has very real, tangible, physical consequences on health. Here, hamsters were housed either alone or with one of their siblings. And they were given a small wound on their backs using a punch biopsy. And starting on the day after the wound was inflicted, one half of the hamsters who were pair housed and one half of the single housed hamsters were restrained in a small tube and they were held there for two hours every day. This is called the chronic restraint stress procedure. In all of the hamsters in all of the conditions, uh, the wounds healed over time. But there was one group that healed more slowly than the others. And that's the hamsters who were subjected to the daily restraint st stress and who, had, uh, who were housed by themselves. And the authors actually did a separate experiment to work out the mechanisms behind this. They got another group of hamsters and they housed them either alone or in pairs, and they measured how much cortisol these animals produced when they were restrained in the tube. Cortisol is a hormone that's secreted in stressful situations. And so correspondingly, being restrained in the tube did cause temporary spikes in cortisol production. But these spikes only happened in the socially isolated animals. So being housed with a social partner actually seems to have been enough to buffer the animals against the physiological consequences of that restraint stress and against the negative impacts of it on wound healing. Here's one more example of how housing quality can have dramatic impacts on animal health. This research was done on sprog dolly rats, who are an outbred genetic stock of, stock of rats that are often used in breast cancer research because they actually spontaneously develop mammary tumors. In this experiment, the rats were housed either in groups of five in a large cage or alone in small cages. And when they were 15 months of age, they were checked for tumors. And the rats who were housed in isolation had developed a, low, a larger total tumor burden, and they had more malignant tumors than group house rats. But two months before this tumor check, the researchers had actually assessed the physiological stress response of each rat by restraining them just like the hamsters, except they only tested it once. And just like in the hamsters, the isolated rats had more severe stress responses than the group house rats. And the researchers were actually able to show that the magnitude of this stress response was what predicted the development of tumors a few months after that test. So this shows, again, one more time, that social contact, which is good for welfare in a social species, also helps protect the animals from environmental stressors and from the effects that these stressors have on their health. Now, there's a direct parallel to this rat research in humans. This is data from a paper where researchers tracked almost 3,000 women who had breast cancer. And they asked these women about their social networks, their social connections. How many relatives do you have? How many friends? Do you participate in community or church groups? And based on all of these responses, they classified the women on a spectrum from being either socially integrated or being socially isolated or somewhere in between. And the women who were rated as socially isolated actually died of their cancers at rates twice as high as the socially integrated women. Women who said they had no friends were four times as likely to die of their cancer. And it was similar effects for whether or not they had close relatives. So just as in the rodents, we see that there's tremendous importance of social support in determining health outcomes. There's another important thing to note about this study. If you look at the numbers below each column, N equals, that's the number of women in each of these categories. And you can see that there weren't that many women in the socially isolated highest risk group. They were less than 10% of the entire sample and far larger numbers of women were well socially integrated. 
And so that shows one way in which treating animals humanely isn't just about improving their welfare. And it's not even just about improving their health. It's really also about making them more like the humans that they're being used as models of. Because most human patients can count on some measure of support from their loved ones. And to model this as faithfully as possible in rodents, the right approach is probably also to usually allow them to have some sort of social contact and social, uh, social support in experiments. And there's another way in which worrying about the welfare of research animals is also really about making sure that they're good models of human patients. So I just showed you several examples where environmental enrichment given to lab rodents improved their health outcomes. These were enrichments like social companionship or nesting material. But we can ask ourselves well, what it is exactly about these enrichments that does this, or what do these enrichments do for the animal's welfare? Well, a big part of what they do is that they let the animals control their environments, control their environments in a way that protects them from stressors in the environment. Social companions, for example, provide support that buffers against stressors like the restraint stress procedure that was imposed by experimenters. And that's also, in a way, what nesting material does. If you think about um, how mice live in a lab, the ambient temperatures at which we house mice are actually several degrees below their thermoneutral zone. And what that means is that if they don't have nesting material, they're chronically cold stressed in these environments. But with nesting material, they can use their behavior to create a little micro environment around themselves, a nest, which retains their body heat and keeps them comfortable. And when you think about it, that's exactly what we do as humans too. So I'm sitting in this office right now and the thermostat is set several degrees below my thermoneutral zone. And I'm fine because I put on clothing this morning. I used my behavior to create a nice little snug micro environment that I carry around with me. And so the, hu the humans and mice are both made to control their environments using their behavior, to cope with stressors using their behavior. And so giving animals what they need to use that behavior to control their environment as they want to is not just important for their welfare, but it's also an important way of treating them like humans who typically do have these opportunities. And so potentially, uh, this is also a way of making results of animal research more applicable to human patients. So what I've talked so far, what I've talked about so far is how we house research animals and how we can do that in a way that treats them more like we treat humans. And I've talked about how this might impact the validity of preclinical research. Now I'm going to turn to how we treat animals in the moments when we're running tests on them. And by, what I mean by this is how do we treat them outside of the, let's say, 23 hours a day when they're just sitting in their home cage? How do we treat them when we take them out to actually run tests or to take measurements? I think it turns out there's something fundamentally different about the context in which we usually test humans and the context in which we usually test animals. And what's different is that humans participate in studies voluntarily. They sign consent form and they can choose not to participate if they don't want to. But animals are coerced into taking part in studies. And for a mouse, when it's time to run tests or to take measurements, what being coerced usually means is being picked up by an experimenter who, by the way, looks and smells like a predator to them, and then being moved out of your home cage into some sort of testing apparatus. And these are all things that we know are aversive to mice. And there's actually good evidence that these aversive parts of the procedure can have some pretty dramatic impacts on the outcomes that we measure. Here's some data from the Mogill Lab at McGill University. They work on pain and nociception in mice. And one of the standard tests that they use is the tail immersion test. You take a mouse's tail and you, this one refuses to dip, but you dip the mouse's tail into hot water and then you measure how long it takes for the mouse to withdraw that tail. And what they did in this study was that they pulled together data from over 8,000 mice that they had tested over years and years to evaluate all the potential factors that could affect how quickly mice withdraw their tails. And they found that nearly half of the variance in the outcomes, which is huge, could be explained by the environment of the test. And the most important part of that environment was the identity of the tester. The mice consistently take longer to withdraw their tails from hot water when they're tested by certain specific human individuals. And in fact, the identity of the tester was the single most predictive factor in determining that outcome. And this is true even though all the testers were working in the same lab with the same equipment and with the same protocol. 
the most amazing part of this is that the identity of the tester actually had a larger effect than the genotypes of the mice did. Now you have to understand in this line of research, that's usually what experimenters are trying to determine. Do mice with different genotypes have different phenotypes? Do genetic differences explain behavioral differences? But what these researchers showed is that who tests the animals actually introduces a huge amount of variation or noise into the data that could potentially drown out any of the genetic effects that they're looking for. It seems like there might be an obvious solution to this. If you're running this lab, you'll standardize the test. You'll say, let's have the same person test all of the mice. But the problem actually runs deeper than that. And that's because individual testers don't have uniform effects on all the mice. The effects of each tester actually depend on the genotype of the mice. Or to put it differently, the effect of the mouse's genotype depends on who the tester is. And that's what's called a genotype by environment interaction. Here, what we mean by environment is the person who's doing the testing. And we can see in this example here, a genotype by environment interaction. If you look at the person labeled SW, the author Sonia Wilson, she tested hundreds of mice. And after doing this, she found that DBA2J mice, the middle bar, withdraw their tails faster than AJ mice, the rightmost bar. But then there's also the person labeled JM, that's Jeffrey Mogul, the head of the lab. And he also tested hundreds of mice. And he found no difference. If anything, the difference might be reversed. And in later research, the same lab actually found that mice find the smell of men more aversive than the smell of women. And so being tested by a male experimenter causes something called stress-induced analgesia, which might be part of the reason why Jeffrey's mice leave their tails in the hot water longer than Sonia's mice. So this is a pretty dramatic example where an experiment actually gives you completely different answers according to something that seems so inconsequential as who the person handling and testing the mice is, and potentially how aversive they find being handled by that person. Here's one more example of a genotype by environment interaction in mouse testing. These are the results of a spatial memory test called the Barnes maze. If you're familiar with the Morris water maze, the Barnes maze is basically the dry version of it. So mice are placed inside of a round arena that has many holes in the floor. And their task is to find the correct hole that gets them a reward. And after performing this test multiple times, they learn to navigate to the correct hole more and more quickly. And these experimenters here ran two different versions of the Barnes maze. The first one was negatively reinforced. There were fans blowing air inside the arena during the test. Mice find this subversive to have air being blown over them. And so the reward was that when they found the correct hole, that hole let the mice escape from the testing arena. And in this test, the researchers found very, very clear differences between the strains. The DBA mice in white were much slower to learn the task than C57 mice. But the second version of the test was identical, except that there weren't any fans blowing air in the arena, and the test was positively reinforced. The reward for finding the correct hole was food. And in this case, there was absolutely no difference between the strains. They both learned just as rapidly as the C57s in the first experiment. So like in the Mogul experiment that I talked about before, this is a case where your conclusion about which mice are, in this case, the best spatial learners, depends on how aversive the testing environment is. The DBA mice in particular were negatively impacted by aversive testing conditions. And that's actually an example of what's known as the yerkes dodson law. This is a behavioral law that stems from experiments done in the 1930s. In these experiments, uh, Yerkes and Dodson tested rodents and how quickly they would learn to perform a wide range of different operant responses in order to avoid getting electric shocks. And what they both found was that stronger shocks were more motivating. They made animals learn more quickly, which makes sense. But that was true only up to a certain point. In the case of cognitive tasks that were actually complex, that were difficult to learn, performance actually started degrading when the shocks became too severe. And so that's shown by that rising and then falling curve uh, at the bottom of that graph. And the general law that came out of this work, and that's actually been observed on many occasions since then, is that for difficult cognitive tasks, performance is poor when arousal is very low, when motivation is low. 
but performance is also poor when arousal becomes too high because the individual is then under some considerable stress. So we've seen in this section that the stress associated with testing can alter experimental results. It can affect something basic, like how quickly reflexes kick in to make a mouse pull their tails out of water. And it can affect more complex outcomes like performance on a difficult cognitive task. Try to keep this in mind as I move through the rest of the talk, because I'm going to be focusing specifically now on tests of learning and memory, and because I'll be talking about using automated home cage versions of these tests. And one of the primary goals of this is to reduce or to eliminate the aversive context that's associated with the conventional hand-run test. In other words, the goal or one of the goals of these approaches is to give animals control over testing and measurement so that they engage with the apparatus voluntarily when they want to, just like human subjects. <clears throat> so to start this section, um, what is it really about a standard hand-run operant test that's so aversive to a mouse? Well, first, there's being handled by a predator-like experimenter, which we talked about a little bit already. Second, there's the fact that the arena or the chamber in which the mouse is being tested can also be aversive on its own. And this can be true even if there's not a fan blowing air like in the Barnes maze experiment. Mice are neophobic by nature, which means that an environment can be aversive to them just because it's novel or unfamiliar. And getting over that can require some pretty considerable work in terms of habituating a mouse to a new environment. The third problem is that mice are often socially separated from their companions during a test. And we saw earlier that social support can be very important in helping animals cope with other types of stressors. Finally, mice are often food deprived before taking a test, and that's done to make sure that they're actually motivated to work for food during the test. So if we consider these um, different types of, of potential problems with hand-run tests, how do we go about alleviating them, making test environments less aversive? Let's start with handling. It's fair to ask whether it's even possible to handle mice in a way that they don't find aversive. They might just be intrinsically terrified of us. Well, I'll show you the typical way to handle a mouse. It's to pick the mouse up by the tail. And I read a few papers where researchers tried habituating mice to this so that they'd find handling less aversive by the time they're tested. But these habituation procedures usually take a very long time and they have mixed success. But Jane Hurst and her colleagues did something different. They exploited the fact that mice will instinctively run into a shelter in the presence of a perceived predator, like a human. So what they do is they put a tunnel into the mouse's home cage, like a plexiglass tunnel, not an actual cupped hand. And then the mouse will run straight into the tunnel to hide, and then the experimenter can pick up this tunnel. And after a relatively brief period of gradual training where the tunnel is brought further and further away from the home cage, mice will voluntarily run into the tunnel when a human comes in to, to handle them. And in preference tests, mice have actually shown that they prefer this. Mice who are used to being handled in a tunnel will voluntarily interact with the human's hand and they'll interact with the tunnel. Mice who are used to being handled by the tail will avoid the hand. Now tunnel handled mice even allow humans to scruff them like this and they continue to volunteer to be handled even after this happens. Mice can also be trained to jump or walk onto a cupped hand of the experimenter and then be carried while standing on the hand and they'll also voluntarily interact with the experimenter's hand while tail-handled mice will not. Notice again that this is an issue of whether or not the mice have control over stressors in their environment. Being grabbed by the tail is something that's outside of their control. But if the experimenter is instead asking them to walk into a tunnel or jump onto their hand when they're ready, that really does put them in control of what might otherwise be a much more aversive experience. And Hurston Company actually showed that these handling techniques can affect the quality of data. Here's an odor recognition test that they performed on mice handled in different ways. What happens in this test is that a mouse is put into a box that contains a cotton pad, which has urine from a male mouse on it. They then measure how long the female spends sniffing this urine. And when they repeat this test over three days with the same male's urine, what they expect to see is what you see in the habituation part of this graph, the light blue that she recognizes and remembers this particular smell, and so she spends less and less time sniffing it from day to day. Then on the very last day, this cotton pad is replaced with one that contains urine from a different male. So what happens then, or what we expect to see, is that the female dishabituates, 
and she starts sniffing the cotton pad again. And this shows that she knows that the two urines are different. And that's exactly what they found in mice who were handled using a tunnel in the non-aversive way. But in mice who were handled by the tail, which remember is the standard method of doing this, we don't see habituation and we don't see dishabituation. And it looks like that graph is empty, but that's actually what it should look like. Because what the graph shows is the median response for each trial in the odor recognition test. And for every trial, that median response was zero seconds spent sniffing the cotton pad, which means that tail handling had such a large inhibitory effect on exploration of that apparatus that most of the mice just never engaged with the test stimulus at all. And in case that's not obvious, that kind of ruins this test. So handling mice using a tunnel is one way that we can make measurements less aversive and potentially improve the quality of these measures. But if the animals are picked up using a tunnel just so that they can be transferred into an operant chamber, the other problems remain. They might still be socially isolated. They might be still tested in a strange environment. <clears throat> so the other solution, which also avoids aversive handling, is to test mice directly in their home cage. And that simultaneously tackles some of these other problems. And as it turns out, that also solves the food deprivation problem. Animals don't have to be food deprived to maintain motivation because they actually decide for themselves when they'll engage with the test in their home cage. Generally, they won't do it if they're not hungry and motivated for the reward. But let's quickly take a look at why motivation can be less than optimal in standard hand run tests. First of all, mice have a nocturnal or a crepuscular feeding pattern. Most of their eating of food intake is done in the early part of the night. This can be a problem because the typical working pattern of a scientist is diurnal. Their work in the lab tends to be done during the day when mice are usually sleepy and not so hungry. So if a scientist wants to be in the lab testing mice from nine to five, they've already got a potential motivation problem on their hands. Of course, it's a solvable problem because maybe you have a scientist who's a night owl or maybe you're keeping your mice on a reverse light cycle, which means that their day becomes our night. And in these cases, then the scientist's working hours and the mouse's working hours coincide. But even in this case, you can't get around the fact that mice have tiny little stomachs. They get satiated very quickly. A mouse will eat something like four grams of food per day. But if it's up to them, they'll spread that out over several hours. And they usually won't eat much more than about half a gram at any given time or within any short period of time. So this means that even though as a scientist you'd like ideally to be able to run 100 trials of an operant test in each individual session, the mouse simply isn't interested in working for food for that long. And here's what that can look like when an animal is not interested in working for food in your apparatus. Hmm. It appears that the video is not showing up. Um, technical difficulties. Let me take a second. In case the video issue doesn't resolve, I will describe what we're seeing. We see a mouse. So the videos will not play. So we've got a mouse inside of a team maze, a standard hand-run team maze, one that a mouse will be carried into and then tested. And this team maze has a left arm and a right arm that contain bowls of food. What we see at the beginning of the clip is the mouse on task, solving the problem. The mouse walks right to the back of the T arm, into the right arm, and fetches food from one of the bowls. Correct answer, great. But in the second part of the clip, we see her now start wandering around the apparatus. She wanders over to the other bowl, puts her paws up on it, doesn't even look inside. She goes back to the start of the apparatus, then goes back into the right choice arm, and she's rearing up a lot on the sides of the apparatus. She's not even looking for food. So it seems that she's exploring the apparatus at this point for an entirely different purpose. And the danger is that if we're not attentive to this, then when we see a mouse wandering into one of the choice arms, and maybe she's just exploring, maybe she's not trying to solve our clever puzzle that we've set up for her, we can mistake that for a mouse who is actually trying to solve the puzzle. And if she gets the wrong answer, then we might be led to think that it's because she has poor learning or poor memory capacity. 
when in fact, maybe it's just that motivation is lacking at this particular moment. So as I mentioned before, a potential solution to this is to let animals work only when they're motivated to work. And once again, this is obviously a recurring theme. But what you're doing here is giving the animal control. And if the test apparatus is part of the animal's home cage, or if it's attached to the animal's home cage, that means they're free to go in and to be tested when they're motivated to do so. And for a mouse, this will usually mean at night and in short bursts. I think back again to that Yerkes Dodson law. We're avoiding the rightmost side of that solid line there, the side where the stress of handling and of aversive testing becomes too great and start to starts to, to degrade performance. But we're also avoiding the zone of low arousal on the left side, because that can also lead to low performance. And we're doing that by not testing animals when we've just woken them up in the middle of the day or when they're otherwise in a period of low activity. We're letting them decide to take the test only when they're hungry and when they're ready to do so, when they're moderately aroused, somewhere near the center of that graph where they might be able to perform at a peak level. And I have a video that I would like to show you that shows what that looks like, what testing an animal in an automated team maze, as you see pictured there, can look like. And what you see at first is the animal standing in the main chamber, what's, la what's um, labeled as test side here. And the animal's walking around doing basically the same thing that we saw in the first video, which is off-task behavior, walking around, smelling things, exploring. Then she goes into the uh, start arm of the teammates and actually gives a response. What's great about this is that in this context, it's entirely fine that she's performing off-task behavior, because that off-task behavior takes place in the home cage itself. And it doesn't take place in the maze that's attached to the home cage. So that means there's much less danger that we'll mistake off-task behavior for on-task behavior and end up with basically junk data. We won't mistake a mouse who's exploring the apparatus for one who's actually trying to solve the puzzle and get a reward. Now, there's some interesting results from a study that used an automated apparatus, the same one in that diagram there, the automated teammates, to study the effects of motivation and satiation on performance in a spatial discrimination task. This was done by Brianna Gaskill, and she trained mice in this apparatus using three different reward sizes, either one, two, or four pellets. And what she found was that mice showed better overall performance in the long run if she trained them using small rather than large rewards. And that's exactly what she predicted, because mice become satiated very rapidly if they're given large pieces of food for each correct response. And then they lose motivation to answer correctly on the next trial. She also found that performance was much less variable with small rewards. The mice who were trained with small rewards got very good overall scores in every successive block of 10 trials that they performed. But for the mice trained with larger rewards, there were some blocks of 10 trials where they were really on task and they had excellent scores. And there were other blocks of 10 trials where they seemed to be totally off and the performance was terrible. And that's a, a symptom of that fluctuating motivation of working really hard when you're hungry and then not working so hard when you're less hungry. I actually found something pretty similar in some of my own work. So over the past few years, I've been working on building an automated home cage apparatus to regulate and to monitor access to drinking water. We built these drinker units uh, and installed them in the walls of mouse home cages. And the drinkers are equipped with RFID readers that detect and that identify individual mice when they stick their heads in to lick the spout. And that's monitored and it's logged by a computer program that then triggers a pump to push out some water to the mouse when the mouse comes to drink. The drinkers also have LEDs of different colors built into them. You can see a blue and a green one here. And we can use these for learning experiments. We can use the lights to cue the mice to tell them when water is available or where water is available and when it's not. So I did an experiment where I trained mice to perform a visual discrimination. They had two drinkers in their home cage and there were three mice in the cage and each mouse was assigned a different color of LED. Here, for example, one mouse is assigned to the green light that's at the top left of every drinker in the cage, and another is assigned to the blue light at the bottom left of every drinker in the cage, and so on. And at any given time, each mouse had a light on at one drinker, but not at the other drinker. 
and they needed to learn to go to the drinker with the light on to get water. And I was able to get mice to perform this task quite well by training them in three stages of increasing difficulty so that by the last stage, they were able to go to the correct drinker by paying attention to their specific light, light of the right color, while ignoring the lights of the other colors that were assigned to their cage mates. And since the mice approach the drinkers at irregular intervals, whenever they choose in this kind of voluntary setup, I was able to use, the, use data from this experiment to show that uh, one of the main determinants of how likely a mouse was to choose the correct drinker, the one with the light on, was how thirsty that mouse was. How long has it been since this mouse has last had a drink? If a mouse had last had a drink in the last minute, then that mouse performed at basically chance levels, 50-50, getting it right or getting it wrong. But the longer it had been since she'd had a drink, the better that mouse performance was. Again, presumably because the more thirsty you are, the higher is your motivation to get the right answer. <clears throat> okay, so to do a little brief recap, we're using automated home cage operant tasks because we want to make testing less aversive and because we want to maintain motivation. And we've already seen some data that shows that each of these components, making it less aversive, maintaining motivation, can improve performance on cognitive tasks in isolation. But does the automated testing itself work? Does it improve cognitive performance? Well, the answer does seem to be yes. Um, here's a comparison of overall performance by, my, by mice in a T-maze alternation task. So this is a task where the mice are rewarded for giving the opposite of whatever their last response was. And this was run in a standard hand-run version and in an automated home cage version, the same one that you've seen diagrams of before. It turned out the mice tested in the automated cage performed significantly better than mice tested in the standard way. And the automated maze helped either by maintaining motivation or by reducing how aversive this test is, or maybe some of both. And again, we might see this as an animal who has control over their testing schedule, and the animal's choosing to work when they're at that optimal level of moderate arousal. They're not sleepy and they're not in distress. And so automated testing can boost performance, but there's a potentially more important set of questions. Does automated testing make the data better or higher quality? Is it more consistent? Does it more accurately measure what we think it measures or what we hope it measures? And is it more relevant to the human patients that the animals are being used as models of? I think some of these questions, especially towards the end, we don't quite have answers to yet, but here are some things that we do know. This is a table that shows the main results from a big study, an international multi-laboratory study, where a group of collaborators asked whether they could replicate the same results in different labs and they were specifically looking for differences between mice of different genetic strains. And out of five tests that they performed, they found genotype by environment interactions in four of these tests. These are shown by the red uh, box here. Remember what the genotype by environment interaction means is that for these four tests, different labs gave different answers. Some labs found differences between genetic strains that other labs did not. Interestingly, there was one test that didn't show a genotype by environment interaction. One test where everyone got the same answer, and that was preference for drinking and all. That also happens to be the only test in this entire paper that's run in the home cage. All of the other tests were tests where the experimenters handled the mice and placed them in some sort of apparatus. And there was actually a similar multi-lab study that was run later on using only automated home cage tests. They used an apparatus called the IntelliCage. And they found consistent results, the same strain differences, in all the labs on all of their outcome measures. And these authors pointed specifically to not handling the animals as one of the factors that was likely responsible for this. Now, as to the question of whether automated tests are not just more consistent, but more accurately measure what we want them to measure, I do wonder whether some of the strain differences in learning or in memory that are reported in the literature might sometimes actually be artifacts of other kinds of strain differences. Here's what I mean. For example, let's say one strain consistently does better than another genetic strain on a hand-run test of memory. Is it because that first test truly has a better memory? Or is it maybe, for example, because that strain is less fearful and so is less impacted by an aversive test environment? Um, this is something that I actually like to test 
in the near future. And what I'd like to do is to choose a type of test and a group of strains of mice where the literature says we should expect some pretty clear strain differences. And ideally, this would be a group of strains that's also known to differ in how they react to aversive handling in novel environments. And then I'd like to run these animals through hand-run and automated versions of the exact same test, which I don't think anyone has done in a multi-strain study yet. And what I predict is that the hand-run test will reveal some strain differences. For example, in this mock-up graph, the difference that strain A outperforms strain B. But I also predict that these differences might not be present in the automated test. And that would actually provide some, some, I think, compelling and direct evidence that it's specifically the way that the test is run that is creating these strain differences. And in the longer term, I think a potential extent, extension of this project would be to run it again as a multi-lab study and directly compare automated and hand-run versions of the exact same test to see whether the automated version is, again, more easily replicated. Now, with the brief time that I have left, I want to show you that using an operant apparatus inside of a, mice, of a mouse's home cage has other applications than just scientific data collection. You could also use it for some veterinary applications, like routine health monitoring. So here's an example from our lab of an apparatus that we nicknamed Mouse Monitor. There's a plexiglass tube that's attached to a hole in the wall of this mouse cage. When mice enter the tube, they're detected and they're identified by an RFID reader that then triggers release of a food pellet. So going into the tube is how they forage. And the tube is mounted on a scale. So besides getting foraging data from the mice a couple hundred times a day whenever they go into the tube, we also get dozens and dozens of different body weight readings for each mouse on each day. And that lets us see some pretty subtle effects, like the, like the fact that mice actually gradually change in body weight throughout the day. They lose up to about a gram during daylight hours when they're mostly sleeping. The idea behind using this apparatus for this project was to test it out as a way of monitoring, of routine health monitoring in animals, a way of identifying sick animals early. One of the things that, that motivates this project is that there was an epidemiological study uh, published a few years ago that looked at all the morbidities reported in a large mouse research facility. And out of all the, the morbidities that happened, the most common one was caretakers just finding a mouse dead before they ever knew that anything was wrong with the mouse. Finding my, mice dead was more common than finding the other most common problems like ulcerative dermatitis or fight wounds. And so if we can make an automated surveillance system that can flag animals when they fall sick before it's too late, then that could help a lot in the future in terms of either getting animals treated or humanely euthanized before they spontaneously die. And it turns out that this apparatus can detect illness in mice well before a human observer can. Some of the mice in our project got an injection of LPS, which induces sickness behavior. And the difference between these mice and the control mice who are not sick could be detected behaviorally by this apparatus within two to four hours after the injection and it manifested in the form of reduced feeding behavior. Now, in contrast to this, human caretakers who were physically examining the mice could not tell the difference between the sick and the um, healthy mice on the morning after the injection, nor on the afternoon after the injection, 24 hours later. And so that's an example of how tapping into foraging motivation of lab animals using this sort of home cage foraging apparatus can let us collect some essential data on their health for other purposes than research. To finish, I'd like to touch on one more thing. I focused so far in this talk mainly on how taking the operant apparatus and bringing it into the home cage lets us get rid of all the aversive aspects of a hand-run test, the things that mice don't like about them. But I think we can go further than that. If we design the tasks right, we can make it so that mice don't just not dislike them. We can make it so that the mice actually like the tasks, which means that we'd be taking what's normally a bad testing experience and turning it into something that animals actually want to do. And we do this by turning it into something that they have control over, and that's a form of enrichment that we would add to their home environments. Now, how do we know whether experimental animals really like a task? How do we know that they're doing it because they like it and not just because that's how we've set up environment, their environment? Because we've basically bribed them by telling them you have to do this to get food every day. 
Well, here's a nice example from the literature, right? I think it's pretty clear that the animals like the task. There's a video that goes with this, and I would really uh, encourage you to look up this um, this paper and look at the videos in the supplementary materials because they're, they're really worth a look. This is work by Julie Mabin-Ferrand, who trained dozens of individual wild birds on a visual discrimination task. Or rather, she put the apparatus in the forest and the birds just started coming to it. They volunteered to train themselves. And the video in question is one of a bird who's clearly mastered pecking on whichever key on this apparatus displays a red light in exchange for some mealworms. And since these are wild animals who are engaged with an operant apparatus in their native environment, I think it's definitely clear that it's not the case that they're somehow forced into, per into performing this task because there are other places they can get food and they don't really even have to come near this box if they're not interested. And there's another phenomenon that suggests that captive animals also like to work. It's called contra freeloading and it's been observed repeatedly in many different species. Contra-freeloading free, contra is when animals prefer to work to get food instead of getting that same food for free. For example, you might have a bowl of free food beside a lever, and if the animal pulls that lever, that dispenses the same food that is available in the bowl right beside it, and animals will pull that lever. An example of this that I really like is one that comes from pigs. So the pigs in this study were exposed to two types of pen, one where it was easy to get food and one where it was difficult to get food. The first pen had straw on the floor and food in a trough, very easy to get. The second one also had straw on the floor and had the same type of food, but it was scattered inside the straw, which meant the food was harder to get because the pigs had to root through the straw with their noses to find it. And when they were later tested as to which environment they preferred to spend time in, the pigs actually chose the environment where they had to work for food, to find that food in the straw. And the reason that I like this specific experiment is because it's one where the task that the pigs have to perform to get that food is a normal part of their repetitive behavior as pigs. Pigs are intrinsically motivated to root in the substrate for food when they're hungry. So it makes a lot of sense that a pig would like this type of work. And it illustrates how using what the animal is naturally designed to do is a huge part of making a successful enrichment and making a successful operant task. In addition to tapping into the animal's natural foraging repertoire, I think something else we should consider when designing operant cognitive ta tasks in the home cage is whether these tasks are cognitively stimulating to the animals because that could make them extra enriching. There's an inter interesting review paper on this topic on how we can make cognitive tasks interesting to animals. And in this paper, the authors propose that a crucial dimension that determines how an animal feels about a task is how challenging that task is, and whether or not the degree of challenge is well matched to the animal's degree of skill. If a task is too easy, the animals may become bored with it. If it's too difficult, they may become frustrated. But if a task is well matched to the level of skill, then the authors suggest that if these animals are anything like humans, they might experience what in psychology is called a state of flow. Flow is this rewarding, highly engaged state of mind that uh, I think locally we could call being in the zone. And I think I experience flow sometimes, as an example, when I'm writing computer code or when I'm climbing at the climbing wall. And in both cases, it happens when that level of challenge is just right, when I've just about got it and I really need to just give the task my, my full attention and effort to succeed. And the outside world kind of loses focus and fades away because I'm fully concentrated. And that's a really rewarding, pleasurable state. And I think if it's something that we can possibly let animals experience when they're in our care, then that would be a great target to strive for. And that might mean making operant tasks in the home cage progressively more difficult as the animals gain in competence to keep that match between competence and skill. And that is a good fit with how some complex tasks have to be taught anyway. They have to be taught in stages. And so I think that by keeping these design principles in mind, we can come up with the right tasks that animals will end up enjoying and that they'll want to engage with. So to summarize, uh, I hope I've shown you that there's potential in designing automated versions of tests for laboratory animals and integrating these tests into their home environments that there's potential to make the lives of the animals better by giving them back some measure of control. 
giving them the option to avoid aversive situations, the option to participate in our experiments only when they want to, and even the options to seek out intense positive experience, experiences, potentially. And that's what true environmental enrichment is. And there's potential in doing this to improve the quality of the science as well. Potential to get more consistent results that can be replicated between labs. And hopefully to get more meaningful results because we start treating animals like we treat human patients, which means giving them control and placing priority on their well-being. And I think and I hope that in the long run, this can lead to improved welfare for the lab animals and to improved outcomes for human patients. So to finish, I would like to thank all of my collaborators listed here who worked with me on the projects that I've mentioned in this talk. Uh, thanks to LabRoots for giving me the opportunity to speak today, and thanks to Alexis for moderating, and thanks to everyone for watching. Thank you. I would like to once again thank Jamie for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, what are some of the tools that are available to someone who wants to start using automated tests like this? And where do you start? Okay, um, I think that there are maybe two routes that you can go and it maybe depends how, uh, how comfortable you are tinkering. So one route that you can go is the sort of uh, commercial, commercially available, uh, the route of using commercially available equipment. So the IntelliCage, which I mentioned during this uh, presentation, is I think the biggest player in terms of being a ready-made solution that you can buy and start using in your lab. And what the IntelliCage basically is, is a cage that's outfitted with uh, what they call operant corners, which are uh, sides of the cage that the animals can go to and be identified via RFID and perform an operant task with light cues, much like in the apparatus that I showed you um, that I designed with water rewards and so on. And there are some other players in the market. I can't list all of them off the top of my head, but some of the others that are there are actually derivatives of the IntelliCage. So there's the Pheno Cube, I believe, which is uh, based on the IntelliCage and is really targeted at researchers in drug discovery. It might be something to look at if you're in that area. And there's the Pheno Master, which is a modular version of the IntelliCage components. So instead of being a full-on cage that comes with everything, it's, for example, the operant corner is a standalone that you could plunk into another cage. The other route that you could go if you're interested in tinkering is uh, reading academic papers by teams like ours and many others who are building these environments and then um, releasing a lot of the details. For example, for our uh, water drinker apparatus, we'll be releasing a lot of that open source in the near future. And a lot of these environments are based on RFID. They're using RFID to track position. They're using RFID to identify individual animals within group settings. And usually these are either built directly into the cages or they're built into larger environments, kind of a imagine free range mice living 40 to a barn. Um, there are some papers like this. And sometimes they're, they're built into attachments that are added onto a cage, like a maze that sits outside of a cage and lets animals enter and perform a task. Um, last thing I want to mention is there's actually a lot of academic teams as well as some um, commercial teams using machine vision. And this is kind of a different approach. This is collecting data in the home cage, um, but it's usually doing so in, uh, I guess you could call it a passive way. So the animal's being filmed and some sort of parameters about position and location and potentially behaviors like grooming or social behavior or vital signs are being extracted. There's actually a talk um, in our track in this lab roots uh, conference on this kind of approach. And that is, in, I guess, in contrast to the approach that I've been talking about, which is uh, active data collection, because you get data when the animal interacts with the apparatus rather than just by filming the animal. But I think it could be interesting to see whether these start to merge in the future. Um, as far as I know, it hasn't. But there are some of the machine vision approaches that try to identify animals visually. 
And I could see that potentially being combined, if it's done in real time, with some of these active approaches, which almost always rely on RFID. And if that was the case, if the animal could just be identified visually in real time, we could skip the whole RFID uh, implantation procedure, and that would make it even less invasive. It's already fairly minimally invasive. Thanks for the question. Our next question is, you mentioned several cases where different researchers or different labs do the same experiment but get different results. How would we go about testing, excuse me, how would we go about telling which one of them got the right answer? Hmm. Okay, um, let me answer that in two parts. So I think the first part is that if two labs get different results, neither one of them is necessarily right because of um, what's known as phenotypic plasticity, which is basically that a genotype doesn't always result in the same phenotype, the same behavioral output, for example. A certain genotype, or the phenotype is the product of the genotype and the environment. The environment includes things like the lab where the experiment is conducted. And so because of that, it is kind of normal that sometimes we get different answers in different environments. And it's not because anybody because one lab is right and the other one's wrong, or one lab's screwed up or something. Uh, there are papers, very good papers on this by Hanno Verbal, if you're interested in the issue. And, and this kind of approach where we kind of embrace the diversity of different outcomes in different populations kind of fits with the idea of personalized medicine in humans, where different treatments work for different people or in different environments, and sometimes they don't work for others in other environments uh, or in other you know, people with different genetics, for example. And so I think that by running the studies in many environments and finding out that, oh, it works here but not there, if we do this enough, maybe we can start to understand why it is that it works here and not there and maybe what the relevant differences are. The second part of my answer is that I do think that sometimes some testing environments are more right than others, specifically when we're doing something to make them more human-like, better models of the actual population, and that's mostly what I've been talking about today. Um, an example that I think is striking but I didn't mention in this talk is a paper published, I think, in 2016, where they looked at the immune systems of mice in specific pathogen-free barrier facilities. So these are facilities where you come in and you gown up and you get an air shower, and germs do not make it into this facility. They're extremely clean and sterile. And they looked at the immune systems of these mice and compared them to mice from a pet store or mice who lived in a barn. And what they found was that actually, in some respects, the immune systems of the mice in the SPF facility are kind of like the immune system of a newborn human. And the immune systems of the, the dirty mice from the pet store are more like an adult human's immune system. And so if you think about a case like that, I think if we're trying to use models uh, that are meant to represent adult humans with normally functioning immune systems, then it might be more right to do the, uh, the experiment in mice who have normal immune systems because they live in somewhat dirty environments, which of course doesn't mean that we should never work on mice with immune systems that are no good or work on mice who are socially isolated because of course there are people who are immunocompromised and there are people who are socially isolated and of course it's, it's worth developing treatments for them too. Um, it's just important to be conscious of who it is that you're modeling when you work with these different mouse populations or in different settings. Thank you. Our next question is, how much are automated tests being used right now in preclinical research? Are they pretty common at this point? I think that depends somewhat on the, uh, the specific area that you're looking at. So I think there's definitely been a big push in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of preclinical research to automate the procedures, to automate the testing procedures. And that's uh, in part out of a desire to do high throughput phenotyping, to do everything very efficiently. And of course, doing things efficiently a lot of the time means taking the human labor out of it. Um, but a lot of the time that still means developing an operated apparatus that is a standalone thing that mice will be carried to and put into, which of course then is not at all the same thing as this automated home cage testing because they're still handling and there's still potentially this unfamiliar box. So I've seen a lot less of the actual home cage automation like I've been talking today. One area where I have seen a good bit of it is in neurodegenerative model, neuro, neurodegenerative disease models. And that might be partially because the symptoms 
that are of interest in these kinds of diseases are partially cognitive. And um, if you look up, for example, papers on Huntington's disease, there's several um, interesting papers showing that automated cognitive testing in the home cage is uh, a good way of early de of detecting symptoms of Huntington's quite early in mouse models. So that's, that's the main area that I know that it's been used. How much are automated tests being used right now in preclinical research? Are they pretty common at this point? Um, I think in, in a lot of uh, areas of preclinical research, there's, there's definitely been a push towards trying to use automated environments to, to make the research more high throughput. Um, in other words, to take the people out of it in a lot of cases to make the research more efficient, to be able to test more mice in one day, for example. Um, and so that means automating a lot of the apparatus, although in a lot of these cases that means creating an operant apparatus that sits by itself in a testing room and then carrying mice over to the apparatus and putting them inside. So even though that's a, a kind of widespread form of automation, it's very different from this home cage automation. It has different goals. Um, one area of preclinical research where I have seen a fair bit of, of automation in the home cage and automatic data collection in the home cage is models of neurodegenerative disease. And I, I think that's partially because the, the symptoms that are of interest in neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disease are often cognitive symptoms, learning and memory. And uh, if you look up Huntington's disease models in particular, there are, are several good papers where the researchers show that this kind of monitoring actually uh, leads to early detection of Huntington's disease symptoms. Our next question is, how far do you think that this can go? Are there other types of tests that could be automated and run in the home case? And are there some types of tests that this just wouldn't work for? Uh, I, I think that there are definitely other tests that this approach could spread to. So I've, I've been mainly talking here about uh, operant tests that are more kind of cognitive in nature, like asking an animal to come solve some sort of puzzle to, to get a reward. But potentially you could do this for any kind of behavior that you could bribe the animal into performing, really. Uh, so I could picture some, some kinds of common tests like maybe a rotor rod test or a grip strength test that right now is usually done automatically, being done like this, perhaps in some sort of little module that would be attached to a cage temporarily for the duration of the test. Um, I could also see larger kind of maze tests, like an elevated plus maze or an open field, being used with these kinds of approaches as well by uh, maybe having a port in the side of a cage and then wheeling one of these mazes over and attaching it to the port and then letting mice come through and test themselves and explore these arenas when they're ready. With something like an open field, that's really what the test is about. Is the mouse going to explore the arena? Um, there, there are some other types of tests that I don't see working in this kind of environment. Like for example, if you've got a test that is about the animal's reaction to aversive handling or to some other aversive treatment, then of course it might be, it would be counterproductive to take that aversive component out. Like, for example, the restraint stress test that I showed with the hamsters and rats early on in the talk, you don't want to take the restraint stress out of there because then you have no more test. Um, and I think there's obviously some veterinary applications where even if we're doing this kind of monitoring, like I talked about in mouse monitor and being able to flag sick animals early on, we're not going to take all the hands off out of that because if you've got a sick animal, maybe the vet needs to palpate it or pick it up to really examine it properly. Um, yeah, so I think mixed bag answer. And it looks like, like it looks like we have time for one more question. Okay. You talked about how animals wouldn't volunteer to get tested when they're not motivated. But then you also showed that the animals in automated tests do make responses when they're not hungry or when they're not thirsty. So does this really solve that problem of low motivation if they're still making responses then? Yeah, um, so you're, you're right that in the, in the foraging experiment on small or large rewards, I showed uh, 
decreased performance in animals who were trained with large rewards and attributed that to them becoming satiated. And then, especially in my uh, experiment on drinking in the mice, I showed that they perform very badly when they've just had a drink, so they're not thirsty. So it is, in a way, weird that they're even deciding to go to the apparatus and make a response when they're not thirsty. Um, so, of course, this isn't perfect at only picking out the very peak motivation moments of the animals. And it might be that these animals are making responses where they are still maybe a little bit motivated to drink, but just not very much. So they don't care that much. Or it might be that they're actually exploring at that point and not trying to make a response. And that, that might be difficult to distinguish. But I think at least the advantage that this gives is that um, if you think about that, that water rewarded visual discrimination again, where we looked at how long since the last drink, um, one thing that this lets you do is to examine the factors that determine performance, like how long it's been since a, a mouse last drank, and then go, ah, um, when the mouse hasn't had a drink, when the mouse has had a drink within the last minute, this data is basically garbage. And then I can go in there and weed out that data and only keep the data where the animals are at peak motivation. So the animals can help us along by picking their most motivated tie points, and we can do a bit of the rest, basically. I would like to once again thank Jamie for his presentation. I'd also like to thank Labyrinths for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I'd like to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of 2018. You will receive an email from Labyrinths letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share the announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. Goodbye, and thanks again, Alexis, and everyone at home.